One of these young ladies claims that women are the useless sex. What is your name, please? My name is Oriana Pallacci. My name is Oriana Pallacci. My name is Oriana Pallacci. Only one of these young ladies is the real Oriana Pallacci. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Orson Bean, and Kitty Carlisle. On to Tell the Truth with your host, Bob Collier. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, good evening, and welcome once again to To Tell the Truth. Good evening, panel. Hi. 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 You know, we're brought to you tonight by Winston Filter Cigarettes. Panel, I'm sure you're anxious to know what's ahead, so please open that envelope, if you will, and follow along with me on this first one. I, Oriana Falacci, am an Italian journalist and writer. Three years ago, I embarked on a 35,000-mile trip to learn as much as I could about the status of women all over the world. Among the discoveries I made were the following. In Pakistan, women don't even possess a last name. In Malaya, women do all the work and run the family. There are more single women in Hawaii than in any other spot on the globe. A Chinese husband can divorce his wife if she talks too much. I have come to the conclusion that what really makes 20th century woman unhappy is her absurd rivalry with men. I have summarized my conclusions about women in a recently published book called The Useless Sex, signed Oriana Falacci. <laughs> three ladies all claim to be, as you heard, Oriana Falacci, author of a book called The Useless Sex. And we'll start this questioning, if we may, with Tom Poston. Oh, Tom? thank you, bud. Uh, <coughs> number three, where do you send a Mother's Day gift? <laughs> what is a Mother's Day? Mother's Day is, uh, is a time that we, in this country at least, choose to honor our, our uh, female parents with a little gift. Do you, uh, oh. what do you, how do you attribute your being here? You see, first of all, I'm not a mother, and uh, But second... somebody had to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was born, in fact. <laughs> well, number two, do you feel that that was a useless endeavor on your mother's part? No, I don't think so. Not <laughs> yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, number one, uh, uh, what do you think of men, generally? Are they more useful or less? Well, they consider themselves more useful. I just believe that it's uh, time they have to prove it. Time? Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Um, number three, how can you say they're useless when in Pakistan, no, in Malaya, the women do all the work and run the family? Do you consider that useful? Boy, I sure do. Otherwise, they'd have a dirty house and no family. <laughs> uh, number two, uh, you are a journalist and writer, in fact. Yes. Well, number two, don't you consider yourself in direct rivalry with men? No, no, not so. How come? Well, very easy, because I don't compete with men, although the, my job is quite competitive. Uh, but number one is, couldn't a man do your job? Yes. Not as I do. Oh, what could you do? To, uh, well, number three, what, kind of, what is your job like? What do you report on? On everything, except a um, subject which interests women. Orson Bean. Yes, well, I come from an old conservative Vermont family who have always believed that women's place is in the stove. Number one. Uh, I personally do not subscribe to this. Uh, number one. Uh, uh, why is it that when you, when you, now, when you take a woman out and, and you go to open the door for her, she races you for the doorknob. Don't you feel there have to be some rules set up that, uh, that about behavior between the sexes? Definitely, I and agree. And what do you think they should be? I definitely think she should wait. It is her right to wait to have a man open the door. But does not this imply that she is inferior, therefore to be taken care of? No, I don't think that that implies that at all. All right. Number three, uh, uh, you say that women are made miserable by uh, this rivalry. It don't make us feel too good either. What can we do about it? 
Last thing you Yes, I, I mean number two. I'm sorry. <laughs> Will you repeat the question I was not <laughs> No, I don't think I can. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good question. <laughs> I'm confused, number three, about the, uh, the fact that you say that women are useless, and at the same time you feel that they should not compete with men in their own work. What should they do? You know, I'm very modest. That's the reason why uh, I consider them useless. I think that... Uh, they should do even less. Ah, you mean even less in terms of work? Of everything. Ah, oh, marvelous. <laughs> I'm for that, I'm for that. Number two, what is a yashmak? Oh, it's a veil that is used in India. Thank you. Number one, who was the... Po oh, that, no. Oh, I only the got time we have, what? I'm sorry to say, but it is May time for you to mark your ballot work. without consultation, please. <laughs> Simply vote now for the one you think is the real one. Voting for number one, number two, or number three. Our team of challengers will, of course, get the customary $250 for every incorrect vote. Are all ballots marked? They are. Very well. Tom, start us off. With, for whom did you vote? I voted for number one, bud. Uh, I think that of the three ladies up there, if they'd had a chance to answer Orson's question, she would have answered it the best. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy Cass, which one do you think is the real one? Well. I love to have people take care of me. I voted for number one, though, because I'm crazy about her suit, and it looks as though it must have come from Italy. <laughs> Orson. Well, I, I think that the title is uh, not meant to be taken seriously, the useless sex, probably, and that's where we get thrown off a little. I voted for number three because uh, the, the name Oriana Falacci is a real Italian name, and she was a real Italian lady and could write a book like that in Italian, which would then be translated by... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number two. Uh, I don't think anyone who is uh, a busy journalist would say that women should do less and less. And I agree with you. We didn't get the philosophy of the book straightened out. No, but did you notice there's a tremendous hostility in our audience this evening? <laughs> I think we better straighten it out right away. <laughs> I voted for number two. Very well. It's uh, widely split then. That means that there were two for number one, one for number two, and one for number three. Let's find out immediately which one of these ladies, in truth, is the author of a book called The Useless Sex. Will the real Oriana Falacci please stand up? Very well. Thank you very much, Ms. Falaji. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you may be seated, if you will. Well, I find out about your two uh, partners in crime here. Number one, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Louisa Moffat, and uh, I'm just a housewife from New York City. Don't say just a housewife. <laughs> a housewife. Just a housewife. <laughs> and for she's about her suit is from Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Karina Novet. And I'm a self consultant for a reducing machine called Relaxercise. Ah! <laughs> well, ladies, you should be very happy tonight because you reduced the budget as far as the panel is concerned, anyway. You nipped it for three incorrect votes, and that's three times $250 or $750 you get to divide. And we hope it brings you great joy. You brought that to us, and we're grateful to you for that. Good night, and God bless you. Let's take time out for a brief film. Be back in a minute. Now let's meet our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Ronan O'Reilly. My name is Ronan O'Reilly. My name is Ronan O'Reilly. Panel, follow along, if you will, with this story. I, Ronan O'Reilly, operate two rather unusual commercial radio stations. Since the British government does not allow commercial radio, our studios and transmitters are located aboard two ships anchored in international waters off the coast of England. We have some 40 advertising sponsors for our American-style disc jockey programs. Although the authorities frown at our very existence, we are on the air 14 hours a day. My two floating stations... Caroline North and Caroline South 
draw some 10,000 fan letters each week from a British audience of 15 million people. Signed, Ronan O'Rahilly. Our panel, these three gentlemen all claim to be, and you heard them claim it, Ronan O'Rahilly of Britain's Offshore Radio Caroline, North and South. Let's start the cross-examination with Peggy Cass. Peggy? Thank you. Uh, number two, your last name is a famous name in Ireland. What did one of your ancestors, somebody by that name, what was he, a famous O'Reilly? He built ships. Thank you. Uh, number, th number three, where in international waters is, are, is your ship, I mean, where off the coast of England? There are two ships. One is in the north of England, off, off the Isle of Man and the other is in the south of England. Thank off. you. And number one, where are the Scilly Islands? Scilly Islands are yeah. off, the, off the coast of Cornwall. Thank you. Number three, what do they do there on the Scilly Isles? <laughs> uh, they, they raise sheep. Thank you. Um, number one, how many people do you use on your crew? Well, we've got a crew of actual people on the ship of 16, which includes the disc jockeys. And, oh, it does. Thank you. Orson Bean. Yes, number three, how many disc jockeys do you have? There's 12 altogether. 12 on counting the two ships? That's right. <coughs> uh, number one, uh, what is Radio Luxembourg? Radio Luxembourg is also a commercial radio station, but it, it's in the evenings. Number two, uh, on what frequency can you be found on radios? Uh, which boat would you like to know? Uh, what? Which, which boat? Which, which, which boat? boat? I, mean, I mean, do you have a specific frequency where people oh, can yes. find you all oh, the time? Yes. We have and two frequencies. One, two frequencies. One for it. And well, why isn't somebody else using the frequency? Well, because if you're no, illegal, we, we, I mean. picked, we picked these frequencies because they were free. Number three, does, does the British government ever try to jam you? No, they don't. Number one, do you ever play Lawrence Welk? Good boy. <laughs> <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. Number three, are you an actual disc jockey? Number three. Am I a disc jockey? Yes. No. I uh, I, are you a disc jockey? No, I couldn't even be, no. No, number two, how far is your ship from the shore? It's just outside the three-mile limit. How do you get there? By boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was a question straight from the Silly Island. Do you, <laughs> number three, do you have a ferry service? Uh, yes, we do. Number one, who is Sidney Bernstein? He's the head of uh, Granada Television. Number two, who's the head of the BBC? I really don't know. Number three, if the government frowns on this, uh, how much do you get per um, commercial? Per frown. Sorry? <laughs> how much do you get per commercial? Uh, about 180 pounds per minute. Oh, per minute. Thank Tom Poston. Number three, who's the head of BBC in England? Uh, Carlton Green, I think, is the post, the head man. Uh, how come number two didn't know number three? <laughs> not, how come? He, maybe what, he did. What do, you, what do you think about the, uh, the uh, O'Reilly in Ireland that's famous? What did he do? Uh, the O'Reilly? Yeah. Um, uh, as far as I know, he, he, he was a leader of um, the revolution in, in, in 1916. He was one of the leaders. Thank you. Now I will ask number two, uh, have I ever appeared on your, your program? On my program? Yes, in your I, I have no program as such. You may have appeared. You haven't appeared on our station, no. Never? Never. That's all the time we have. It's time for you now to mark your ballot. So will you do so at once without any consultation with each other whatsoever? And, of course, no changing of your vote once you have marked it. Simply vote swiftly and accurately for the one you think is the real one. Voting for number one, number two, or number three. All marked, and quickly. Very well, Tom, for whom? Well, I just marked, uh, I just marked for number one. Uh, I thought he looked uh, about as much as, I have a friend who runs WNEW here, and he looks more <laughs> like him than the other two, so I... Peggy! <laughs> 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 well, I voted for number one, because if my name were O'Reilly, I'd know that it was a famous Gaelic poet, and number three said they raised sheep on those islands. I thought they raised flowers. <laughs> they waste flowers on the Silly Islands. Oh, they do? Yeah. Well, flower-eating sheep, I didn't know that. Orson Bean. Yes, I voted uh, for number one. He looks to me like he has the, the kind of American know-how that a young English boy would need to go out and <laughs> build a radio station on a boat and... <laughs> <laughs> still have American know-how. 
Kitty. I feel terrible because I wanted to vote for number one, but I'd already marked for number three because I thought maybe he was a disc jockey, and then it turns out he wasn't, and, and they're always right, and I'm always wrong, and no, so I'm right. You're in fine shape tonight. I think Don't it's feel bitter. bitter. Just sit there and sulk and see what happens. <laughs> there were three votes for number one and one for number three. Let's find out at once which one of these gentlemen, in truth, is the real Ronan O'Reilly of Britain's offshore Radio Caroline. Will the real Ronan O'Reilly please stand up? Gracefully, have a seat, if you will, please. Uh, how many hours a day do you broadcast? Your ship? Four, Fourteen hours a day. Fourteen hours a day. That's right. Oh, that's a full schedule. Well, continued success to you. Thank you very Thank much. Idea. Number one, you got most of the votes. What is your real name and what do you really do? <laughs> My name is Nigel Dempster, and I'm a roving correspondent for the Daily Express. <laughs> Number two, what is your real name and what do you do, sir? I'm Tom Cooper, and my, uh, I'm a representative for the Guinness Heart Breweries. <laughs> well, when we check the score, we find you did extremely well. There were three incorrect votes, and that should brighten everything for you tonight. That's three times $250, a total of $750. What that is in pounds, I don't know, but I hope it brings you the same joy. Thank you, good night, and God bless you. <laughs> in a moment after this message of interest. All right, let's meet our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Belle de Rosier. My name is Belle de Rosier. My name is Belle de Rosier. Panel, follow along with you with your copies of this story. I, Belle de Rossier, am an outfitter and hunting guide operating out of the town of Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory of Northwest Canada. I take four hunters at a time on three-week trips into the rugged wilderness just below the Arctic Circle. We go after moose, grizzly bear, caribou, and the much sought-after fanning sheep. I personally hold a record for dropping a running 1,400-pound polar bear with one shot. In Whitehorse, I am known as Belle of the Yukon. Signed, Belle de Rossier. We bring you these three ladies, each of whom has made a concerted effort to be known as Belle de Rossier, outfitter and hunting guide up in the Yukon. Let's start with Orson Bean. Orson? Yes, uh, uh, Belle of the Yukon number one. Uh, how big is a moose? Oh, they run around uh, 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. Well, number three, if you shot a moose, how would you get it home? <laughs> pack it on the pack horses. Pack it on the pack horses? They could carry a thousand pound moose? Oh, not the whole moose, no. No, you wouldn't want all of the moose. Right. Some of the parts are not as good as others. I've heard that. Uh, number two, tell me about the town of Whitehorse. Is there some nightlife there? What there does one do to it? There certainly is. How do you nightlife. while away the long night up in Whitehorse? We drink a lot of hot buttered rum. Ah, that's <laughs> class. Uh, number uh, one, uh, a, 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 this sought after sheep, the Fannin sheep. I never heard of anyone looking for one. Why, number one, is he so sought after? Because they're rather rare. Oh, well, that'll do it every time. <laughs> Kitty. Number two, what is a mouflon? I don't know. You know number three? No. Oh, well. Uh, number one, what is on Sitka that's sort of interesting? On Sitka? Yes. That's not in the Yukon. Oh. Does that make any difference? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> number two, were you born in the Yukon? Yes, I was. Uh, number three, when you had shot this uh, large animal, what did you use in the way of a rifle? A uh, 30 caliber rifle. How far can you hit something with a 30 caliber rifle? About 400 yards. Number two, you don't wear glasses? No. For anything? Never. Uh, number one, what is the largest animal you ever shot? Tom Poston. No, he's... Ah! No, no, no. I'm sorry, Tom. 
Well, it's your time to question. I was hit somewhere between the Rockies and the Pacific. Uh, number one, do you have an American counterpart, a lady who uh, does guides in, uh, in the western, northwestern part of the United States? Not that I've ever met. No? Uh, do you know what a mouflon is, number one? A mouflon isn't in uh, the Yukon. No. I believe it. Tell me, number two, uh, what is a badger game? Do you know? No, I don't. Do you know number three? No, I don't. Number three, do you know what a deadfall is? Yes, I do. What's a deadfall, my dear, Belle? Uh, it's a, a deadfall is uh, some logs that's rigged up, and if you trip the uh, lever, fall on you. Thank you. Peggy Cat. Number one, where would you find a mouflon? A mouflon? I'm not just sure. I believe it belongs to the sheep family. Thank you. Uh, number two, are there any limits on how many moose you can catch? Yes, during hunting season one, we can bag one. Thank you. Number three, what's a caribou? A caribou is a member of the deer family. Uh, number one, which poet made the Yukon famous? Robert Service. Um, number two, what's the Indian tribe that's predominant in the Yukon? The Athapac, Apaskan, and the uh, Rib Dog. The rib Dog. Mm -hmm. Number three, are you licensed by the... That's all the time we have. It's time for you now to check your own licenses and your ballots will be behind them. Mark them at once, if you will, please, without change and without consultation. Vote. Vote for the one you think is the real bell of the Yukon. And vote for number one, or number two, or number three. All ballots are now marked. I see, Sir Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number three. I thought that, well, she knew what a deadfall was, at least in one sense. But I, I thought that uh, there was a, a famous uh, a lady guide that did all the whitewater uh, uh, guiding and so forth in this country. But I may be confusing it with uh, the Canadian guy. I voted for number three. Peggy. I voted for number two. Because when I was a kid, I'd go to all the movies about, uh, you know, Alaska and Yukon, and all the heroines used to look like her. Oh. <laughs> What is your choice? They're all marvelous. They're two great liars up there, whoever they are. And number two mentioned the rib, the rib dog tribe. I've heard of many of the most minuscule and far out Indian tribes. I've never heard of the rib dogs. I thought it for number three. <laughs> And Kitty, which one gets your vote? I voted for number three. Number three has a kind of marvelous look in her eye, and I think she could shoot a large animal at 400 yards. I believe what she said. So that makes it three for number three and one for number two. Well, let's see how that works out, shall we, as we learn now which one of these ladies, in truth, is the real Belle of the Yukon. Will the real Belle de Rossier please stand up? <laughs> Shaky evening, you all pulled together on this one. It did very well, I must say. Uh, how, how much time of the year? Do you, uh, is this an all-year-round thing that you do, or just no, certain it seasons? No, it's seasonal. Uh, what seasons, mostly? From August till October. I see. What do you do the rest of the time, Miss Bell? The rest of the time, ski, snowshoe, drive dog. Is it true about the hot buttered rum? Oh, yes. <laughs> Is it true? Is it true that mush is a word that was made up in Hollywood? <laughs> That's right. You don't use mush to tell doggies to go ahead. What Some of them do. They used to say it was from French Canadian, meaning marsh, boo. Oh, That's what they say it came from. Number one, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Liz Rice, and I'm a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Demita Mills, and I'm a hostess in the executive dining room for Union Carbine. <laughs> We find that the panel did well this time, but there still was one incorrect vote, and that still is worth $250 for you. And we thank you very much, and only hope you had as good a time as we had, certainly, and as I hope you had, too. Good night, and God bless you. All right, panel, take a minute while we look at this brief film. Well, the time goes fast, and that's all the time we have. So good night, panel. Good night. Good night, bud. Good night from Winston. And, of course, we want you to join us at the same time next week, and I'll be with you tomorrow afternoon on the daytime show. In the meantime, don't you forget to tell the truth. Good night. <laughs> to Tell the Truth is a Mark Goodson, Bill Todman production.
three company and three's trouble for Andy when a lovely member of the Taylor family pays a visit to Mayberry on the Andy Griffith Show later tonight. To Tell the Truth has been brought to you tonight by Winston Filter Cigarettes. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. This is Johnny Olson speaking for To Tell the Truth. This program was pre-recorded.